Today, I'm starting my top 50 board games of all time, 2021 edition. And a lot has changed since I last made this list two years ago. This time, I'm doing it properly, giving each game the love it deserves, so five games at a time. And I'll be releasing the next video in this series when we hit the next goal on Patreon. If you're new to Actual LOL, subscribe for more board game recommendations. And if you want to buy any of the games, there are links in the description. Right, let's get to the first game. My number 50 is my most recent addition to the party, and I've left it by the entrance in case it ruins the vibe. Detective City of Angels is a game that I've been waiting to play for years. I finally got the chance and it didn't disappoint. I love detective games, working together with friends to solve a murder. And City of Angels brings a twist that none of the others have. One player is the bad guy. They play as the chisel and they can lie to you. You'll ask a suspect a question and the chisel will choose what answer to give. And if you think they're holding out on you, you can pressure them. And if your hunch was right, you get to read a different, better answer. But if you're wrong, that character now has leverage over you. It's such a great idea and it works so well because you always want to push, but you can't. So you have to use your intuition, even more than with other detective games. Is it likely that this character is telling the truth? But even more than that, is it likely that your friend, the chisel, would want to cover this up? You're desperate to get the best answer because you're playing competitively against the other detectives, fighting for scraps of information. When someone else gets an evidence card, it's their secret for two rounds, which makes you so jealous because they know something you don't. I think I prefer the co-op mode where the detectives work with each other. But no matter which mode you play, the mysteries are great. I fully expect this one to climb up the ranks the more I play it. We're living in a golden age of detective games, and this one is bringing a lot of originality to the table. And number 49 is my new favorite version of a classic game, Carcassonne Hunters and Gatherers. It's Carcassonne, set in the Stone Age, and let me tell you, the original paleos in comparison to this one. It has everything I like about the original, but with some extra touches that make it even better. Carcassonne has never made it into my top 50 before because it can feel a bit bland. Hunters and Gatherers is more exciting because it encourages stealing. You have these huts which you place on a river, and at the end of the game you get a point for every fish in the entire river system. So someone will build a massive river system full of fish, and someone else, me will try and piggyback off all their hard work by connecting up my hut. The forests, which work like cities, are better because if you finish a forest with a standing stone in it, you get a special tile and an extra turn to place it. So there's an incentive to finish other people's forests. And some of the tiles are really powerful. The other thing I love about the game is that you have more options. In normal Carcassonne, if you get a tile you don't want, it feels like a wasted turn. But in Hunters, the tiles usually have a forest or a river and an animal. And the animals are for hunting, which work a bit like the farmers in the original game. So if you don't care about the river, you can still add a deer to your hunting fields to get points that way. The final thing I love is the threat of the end game, because you don't get any points for rivers or forests that aren't finished. There's more drama in the end game than a Marvel movie as you try to finish them in time. I still have old Carcassonne because it's Carcassonne, and this won't be better for everyone, but you can shoot for the stars more in this game, and that makes it more exciting for me. When my friend Anthony goes to McDonald's, he orders a chicken sandwich, a hamburger, and a filio fish. He calls it the Air, Land, and Sea, and that's also the name of my number 48 game. This is my new favorite two-player game to play with my wife. It's one of those head-to-head -head two player games where you fight over control of a middle ground, which is a niche that is full of great games like Shotentotten and Hanamakoji. You play cards into the three theaters of war, trying to win two of them. Each card has a strength and an ability. And the clever play is in how you use those abilities to attack or defend because they can combo together really well. But the absolute genius of the game is something that no other card game does. 
Each round is a battle, and if you think you're losing the battle, you can withdraw. You should withdraw. Let's face it, not every hand is as strong as another. Sometimes your odds are bad, so you can concede, bow out, and live to fight another day. Even though it goes against everything you believe in, the smart move is to spot your weakness early and withdraw. Because the later you withdraw, the longer you blunder on pig-headedly, the more points they will get for their victory. But it's hard to know how you'll fare, what cards they have and how they'll counter yours. And meanwhile, your ego is telling you, you can do this. It's that dynamic that makes air, land and sea feel so different. A game that rewards humility and biding your time. Number 47 is Merchants and Marauders, which is one of those epic games that I never get to play because it requires such a commitment. But it's on the list because of the memories of the times I have played it. It's a sandbox pirate game. You each have a ship which you sail around the Caribbean and you can decide whether to be a merchant and pleasantly deliver cargo from port to port, like a coward, or be a pirate and attack the other players trying to steal their stuff or destroy their ship. Or you can do both. There are so many things you can do in this game. You can complete missions, follow pirate rumors, upgrade your ship, or be hunted by the Navy. It's so thematic. You will tell a completely different story every time you play it. But that means it's complicated. It's hard to learn and takes many, many hours to play. For me, it's one of the few games that is worth that effort. I love how each rule makes sense and adds to the detail of the world. Like how you can bury gold on an island to stop the others from getting it if they ransack your boat. I love that you don't have to attack each other, but you can. And there's a great tension when you sail near someone and you can't be sure if they're about to go to war with you or let you pass safely. There is luck, but that luck creates surprises and drama and tells you a story that is far more entertaining to me than winning the game. It is my definitive pirate game, and newer pretenders to that throne haven't come close to replacing it. I'm making this top 50 series as part of my Patreon pledge drive. So I've set some goals and I will release the next top 50 video when we hit the first goal. If you like the videos that I've been releasing the past few months, please help us continue to make them by becoming a patron of the channel. And in return, you'll get the actual LOL newsletter where I'll be running down the rest of my top 100, the 50 games that didn't make this list. Thanks for your support. Number 46 is Tobago, which is such a one-of-a-kind game. There is nothing that feels anything like it. You're on an island hunting for treasure. Okay, that's not very unique. But to find the treasure, you need to piece together its whereabouts. And instead of learning the clues, like in a normal deduction game, you make the clues. So you'll play a card onto a treasure that says, it's next to a tree, or it's in the biggest scrubland. You keep adding cards, narrowing it down until there's only one place on the board it could be. And then it's a race to get there first. See, Tobago is a two-faced game. You have the thinky deduction side, and then you have the competition of actually driving your ATV across the island. And they work so well together because you're trying to play the clues that mean the treasure ends up near you. Then when you dig up the treasure, there's this great push your luck phase of divvying it up where you have to decide whether to take what's available now or hold out for something better. All the while hoping not to find the curse, which loses you one of your existing treasures. Tobago has drama and excitement, and it's rare to find that in a game alongside really clever deduction. And it doesn't hurt that it's one of the most beautiful games ever made. These days, this would be called a deluxe edition, and it would cost more than a holiday to Tobago. Unless, of course, you live in Tobago. I also really like the new Volcano expansion, which makes the game even more cutthroat and interactive, because you can literally burn trees and huts and make it harder for other players' ATVs to get around the board because they can't drive through the lava. Which seems off. Are they all-terrain vehicles or some-terrain vehicles? Those are my top 50 games of all time, numbers 50 to 46. There are links to buy them below. And to see the next video in this series, 
help us reach our goal at patreon.com forward slash actual I'm John Perkis. Thanks for watching.